Good morning, everyone. It's great to be able to come together and worship with you all this morning. Uh, we want to especially welcome those who are new to South Columbia. If you are new to SCBC, my name is Jim Chung, and I'm the associate pastor here. And I uh, just want to share with you a little bit about our church. Our mission here is to introduce people to Jesus and to help those who know Jesus to become more like him. And our vision is to carry out that mission by following Jesus Christ through worship, nurture, and outreach. If you'd like to learn more about our church and the different ministries and events that we have going on, please check out our website, which you can find at scbcmd.org. Uh, we do not have a designated time of giving during the service. However, if you'd like to worship through giving and you're here in person, there's an offering box right outside the sanctuary. If you prefer to give online, we invite you to visit our Give page, which outlines all the different ways that you can do that. Um, I think that's it for the announcements. We've come to the time where we greet one another, so if you'll please stand. Let's greet one another in the love of Christ. And if you're watching from home, please drop us a comment or a chat so that we can greet you too. Thanks so much. Good morning, South Columbia. I'm glad that you're here to worship with us. And we want to sing, Lord, reign in me. So sing that with us, please. sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power, over all my dreams, in my darkest hour. please pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, as we gather together and come before you this morning as a body of believers, there are many who are tired. There are many who are hurting, who are stressed and worried about many things. In our worship of you this morning, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring them rest. Pray that you would bring comfort healing, and peace. There are many who come before you filled with energy, who are happy, filled with joy. Wherever we might find ourselves this morning, Father, we come together to meet with you and to worship. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would worship you with all our hearts, Lord, that we would sing out your praises, that we would lift up our thanksgivings, Lord, that we would give with joy, and that we would receive your word. Uh, and we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have revealed yourself and your ways to us, Lord. And so, Father, as we worship you, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit and that you would be blessed, honored, and glorified. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of hymns about trusting and putting our faith in Jesus throughout the day, all day, all the things that we do 
Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Let's sing this together. sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him or Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? 
Please be seated. Good morning, South Columbia. You know, I'm excited to worship with you all. I saw a lot of people coming today. Yeah. Okay, today's uh, scripture reading is in the uh, book of 1 John, chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. 1 John, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 1 to 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in, uh, in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have, you have heard is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. The one who knows God listens to us. The one who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Father, he is the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one can go to you, um, not through Jesus. But we have um, many uh, false, false prophets and uh, false spirits in this world. Father, please give us wisdom to discern and not fall into temptation. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to ask you to stand again. We're going to sing another song. Uh, I was uh, running errands yesterday, and I was in a checkout line, and there was a person in front of me, and uh, when I finally got up, to, it was my turn. Uh, the cashier said, are you having a good day? I said, I, what time is it? I, I guess. I, I don't know. She says, well, you were, you were humming a song. I said, oh. I didn't realize that was out loud. I was, I was humming this song, and, and ironic that the song title is Share His Love. Uh, so you put God's word in your heart, what comes out of your mouth, even when you don't know it. He gives you an opportunity to share his love. So let's sing that together. The love of God is broader than earth's vast expanse. It is deeper and wider than the sea. Love reaches out to all to bring abundant life. For God so loved the world, His only Son He gave. Share His love by sharing what the Lord has done for you. Share His love by sharing of your faith. And show the world that Jesus Christ is to you every moment, every day. All those who have trusted in God's only Son and held this precious treasure in their hearts, seek ways to make it known to all who need to know that God so loved the world, His only Son, He Christ is real to you every moment, every day. We show the love of God each day we live. Reveal Christ's presence in 
in our lives and how the Holy Spirit guides us day by day for God so loved the world his only son he gave share his love by telling what the Lord has done for you share his love by sharing of your faith and show Christ is real to you every moment, every day. Thank you. Please be seated. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and open to 1 John chapter 4. As we continue in this uh, series of 1 John, and I'm going to ask if you'll pray with me. Father, I thank you for what we have sung this morning, that there are everlasting arms on which we can lean. We thank you, Father, that uh, you invite us into a relationship with you where we can know you, Lord, where we can uh, grow and develop in our understanding of who you are. And Lord, we thank you because you, this relationship is one of trust where, Lord, you ask us to believe you and to trust you, that those who come to you must believe that you are and that you are a rewarder of them who seek you. Father, we thank you for uh, something we sung earlier where we've proved Jesus over and over. And we thank you for your faithfulness to us, for your grace for this day. Lord, I, I am thankful for every person who's here, every person who is uh, joining us online. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us so that, Father, we can indeed worship in spirit and in truth. Thank you for the gift of this day and for life itself. And Lord, this morning as a congregation, we bow before you. And as Pastor Jim prayed, Lord, there are so many needs in our lives this morning. And we may come today with, in so many different ways, with so many different burdens or joys on our heart. And Lord, we come and bring them before you. What we pray for is to experience your presence this morning. And we do thank you for loving us and for bringing us together. Now I pray that the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, will guide us into truth today. For I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Rufus Henry McDaniel was born, lived his whole life, and died in Ohio. He was a pastor who, during his lifetime, wrote over a hundred hymns. After the untimely death of his son, McDaniel sat down and wrote the words of a hymn as a reminder of maintaining faith and hope in times of trial. He felt that there was no better way to honor his son than to write music about his faith. And these are the words that he wrote. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Now we probably understand what Pastor McDaniel meant. But that phrase, since Jesus came into my heart, is worth thinking about for a moment. Sometimes when I'm trying to explain this to children, uh, and we're talking about having Jesus in our heart, I will ask them, suppose we were to take an x-ray machine and take a picture of your heart. Would we see a little tiny Jesus living there? I've never had one of them yet say yes. And usually kind of get this sense that they're thinking with questions like that, how did I ever get to be a pastor to begin with? Actually, that expression or specific wording, Jesus coming into your heart, describing what we call salvation, isn't in the Bible. In preaching the good news of Jesus, none of the apostles ever told someone, ask Jesus into your heart. Now, just stay with me for a second. One person said often the exhortation to ask Jesus to come into your heart is used as a simple way to say, ask Jesus to come into your life or allow the Lord to take control. If this is, 
done in the context of presenting the whole gospel, then there's no harm done. But before a person is invited to ask Jesus into your heart, he or she should understand sin and its penalty. The payment of Christ made on the cross, the reality of Christ's resurrection. In fact, referring to salvation as Jesus coming into your heart might even help a person understand that the Spirit of God comes to indwell the soul. And it's that last statement that really explains what happens when you and I repent of our sin and place our faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. God gives us His Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, who takes up permanent residence in our lives. It is the presence of God's Spirit that defines a person as a Christian. The Apostle Paul wrote, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he, that person, does not belong to him, Christ. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Simply said, you can't be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit. There may be too many negatives in that sentence, but I hope you understand what I mean. The Spirit is the evidence that a person really is saved and is the promise that the salvation that God begins in you when you trust him, he will one day bring that to completion. Now, if you have your Bible open, go back just for a second to chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, and look at verse 24. For John says, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know that he abides in us by the spirit he has given us. So if we sing what a wonderful change has been wrought in my heart since, since, since Jesus came to my heart and understand that it's the Holy Spirit who comes into our heart, which is that inner part of who we are, that ruling center of the whole person, the place where you have your will, attitudes, and intentions, the, the, that source of your thoughts, actions, and words, then yes, by all means, sing what a wonderful change has been wrought in my heart since Jesus came into my heart. But you see, John knew that the Holy Spirit was not the only spirit in existence. There are other spirits, false spirits, evil spirits. And because there are, John says, there is the need for discernment. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits and see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, perhaps a reality that too many Christians fail to understand is that the world that we live in is not just a physical one. There's a spiritual dimension, a spiritual reality that exists as well. And I don't mean it in a Ghostbusters, popularized, paranoia context. The Apostle Paul wrote, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul says that there are spiritual forces of wickedness in operation. He recognized that there is a spiritual battle going on, and it does not involve just the evil one, but it involves evil ones. And if I understand what he means, he's saying that human conflict is not always just human conflict. There is a spiritual conflict. Now, I don't know where you are this morning in your understanding or your belief about spiritual warfare, but I think I agree with the observation that C.S. Lewis wrote in the preface to Screwtape Letters. <clears throat> he said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. 
Now, while I don't believe that the evil one is lurking behind every rock and crevice and responsible for every bad thing that ever happens to me, there have been specific moments in my life in ministry that I have considered to be spiritual warfare. I do believe in the evil one, and I do believe in evil ones. In the early days of our church, uh, one of our adult Sunday school classes was using a curriculum and studying the Gospel of Mark. In the fifth chapter, when it came to that account, if you remember the story where Jesus encountered a demon-possessed man uh, who was being destructive to himself, and uh, in fact the Bible says that he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones, and when Jesus asked what his name was, the man said, Legion, implying that there were many, many uh, evil spirits possessing this man. The author of the curriculum said that in Jesus' day, that was called demon possession. But today, we understand that to be a form of, of, of mental health illness or mental illness. By the way, that was the last Sunday we used that curriculum. Why? Why? Because Jesus clearly acknowledged that the man was demon-possessed. And the demons themselves clearly understood who Jesus was. If Jesus affirmed the existence of evil spirits, so were we. John also believed that there were evil spirits, which is why he called his readers and us to be discerning. In that passage we read just a moment ago, Paul charges us to put on the whole armor of God so that we will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Uh, we get our, our, our English word method, uh, methodology from that. It's a word that, that speaks of a deliberate planning or a systematic approach, and it can either have a positive or negative connotation, but since in that verse it is the devil's methodia, we know that it's negative. One person said the negative connotation of methodia implies the use of cleverness, craftiness, cunning, and deception. The deceiver uses specific, subtle, stealthy plans to target each individual, his goal being to defeat, discourage, and dishearten. Stated another way, Satan's attacks are tailor-made. You know, in a world that's becoming increasingly secular and superstitious and even spiritual, <laughs> something Carl Henry said over 30 years ago, I think is probably more relevant today than it was when he said it then. He said, the church can't be blamed for all the ailments of the world. On the other hand, I'm quite willing to concede and insist that the church has unnecessarily accommodated a failure of cognitive analysis. For the past half generation, Evangelical churches have gravitated toward the experiential and even the emotional at the expense of the intellectual. Listen, John calls us to be discerning. Christians can't afford to be naive or gullible or ignorant because what is at stake is truth. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. But not every spirit is true. So how does an untrue spirit reveal or manifest itself? John says it's through the false teaching of false prophets. And John says there are many. Can I just say that again? There are many. There's that which on the surface looks real, sounds real, seems real, but it's not real. As one person put it, indeed, just because a prophet or a teacher uses the language of the Bible, God and Jesus, does not mean that he is a true child of God, a true prophet in the sense of one who speaks forth God's word. Indeed, they may profess to believe in Christ, but they believe in another Jesus and in another gospel. There is a need for discernment, but there's also the test of discernment. Look at verses 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard, it, heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. Now we've talked before in, in the introduction of this uh, book about a heresy called Gnosticism and one particular component called Decetism which denied the humanity of Christ. 
and believe that Jesus really didn't have a, a, a fleshly body, that he was a phantom, a ghost. His body was like an illusion. Now, it very well may be that this is the specific teaching, false teaching, to which John's referring, but I will tell you it's not limited to this one heresy. We mentioned last week that John described those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh as antichrists. And he reiterates the same thing here. And we made the point last time that to make Jesus anything less than who he really is, the Christ, the virgin-born Savior, the Son of God, who's fully God and fully human, is to deny him. And the touchstone by which these false spirits, false prophets were to be tested, was their attitude toward the incarnate person of Jesus Christ. Every spirit or everyone that confesses, every one that does not confess. So what does it mean to confess? Well, actually, this is the, the same word that we saw back in the first chapter, where John says, if, if, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that word confess means to say like. And in, in uh, 1 John 1, 9, there the context means if we agree with God about our sin. Here, confession means to agree with God as to whom Jesus is. But it's not just saying the words. Paul wrote something very similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now I can't prove this to you, but if you came to a traffic light or an intersection and there was someone there holding a sign asking for financial help, and you rolled down your window and said, Hey, I will give you $500 if you just say, Jesus is Lord. I think your money would disappear. But if you said, I will give you $500 if you repent of your sin, trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, and faithfully live for him the rest of your life, there might be a good chance you could put your money back into your wallet or purse. Confessing that Jesus is Lord, that he's come in the flesh, is more than the acknowledgement of a fact. It is a commitment of your life to that truth. Ray Stedman says it well. There are even many who are orthodox in doctrine and who say, yes, of course, we believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. We believe that in that creed, we can show it to you. It's written in our hymn books. We confess it every Sunday morning when we stand up in church and we say, we believe in God the Father, the Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord. But Stedman says, but do they confess him? Do they live by him? Have they committed themselves to the one in whom they profess or believe? This is the searching question that John asks. If they do not confess him, if they do not live by him, then do not follow him. Their error is as deadly as those who deny that he came in the flesh. You know, the Gospels record that evil spirits and demons knew who Jesus was and even acknowledged his deity. But they never believed in him. They never trusted him. A.W. Tozier once said, the devil is a better theologian than all of us and is a devil still. How important is it to rightly believe about Jesus? Listen to what Paul wrote to the Galatians. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who has called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are dis disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And then Paul says this, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. J. Vernon McGee, uh, McGee explaining that verse said, in strong language, Paul says, if any man preaches another gospel unto you, then that which you have received, let him be accursed, which literally means let him be damned. Friend, I cannot make it any stronger. Notice that Paul connects the person of Christ with the gospel message. 
as being the only absolute and trustworthy standard of teaching about Jesus. So it's important that we understand that the Spirit of God, who is truth, will never contradict the written revelation of God's Word. Musician Mickey Moore told this story. He says, one night we were packing up after a concert. We sent a young woman to pick up our children from the home they were staying in. And since the children didn't know her, I told her to give our son Trevor the secret family code word so that he would know that she was authorized to pick them up. A little later, I received a phone call. Trevor refused to leave because the woman hadn't given the right word. Now, he says the mix-up was on my part. I had said the code word was dinosaur monster, which my son informed me was incorrect. It's dinosaur, he said. Are you sure? I was certain it was dinosaur monster. I'm sure, said Trevor confidently. Well, okay, son, I carried on. You're probably right, but it's okay for you to come back to the church with this lady. And there was silence on the other end of the line, and Trevor said, Who is this? It's me, your father, Mickey Moore. Now get in the car and come on. All right, he replied and hung up. He goes on to say it was, it was an odd feeling be interrogated by my six-year-old son. He knew this word, and even though he was given words that were very close to the real thing, they weren't true, and he knew the difference. A mature Christian knows the Word of God and is not easily tossed about with every wind of doctrine. We are to test the spirits by the Word to see if they are true. See, folks, every teaching, every doctrine has to be viewed through the lens of Scripture. And in the context of 1 John, especially what's being taught about Jesus, there is a need for discernment, there is the test of discernment, and then there is an assurance from discernment. Look at verse 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than is he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. With emphasis in his wording, John assures the readers, you are from God. It's a statement of their, uh, where they came from. Uh, you could say you belong to God. And John says that, that the Christians have overcome. They overcame the false teachers. And, and the Greek tense implies that there was a point of conflict where, where they made that decision, and it's resulted in an ongoing state of victory for them. It wasn't just a momentary victory, but they continue to live with that insurance. And notice, though, that John reveals the reason, the source of their victory. He says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. wish we could play Go Fish's song right now. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go Google it and look it up. Two powers are contrasted. He who is in believers and he who is in the world. So who is the one who's in believers? Well, in the context, it's clear that it's the Spirit of God. Who is the one who is in the world? It is the evil one, the prince of the power of air, Satan. I like the New American Commentary. It says, the world is the devil's domain, and its philosophy is an expression of his value and agenda. He attempts to kill, uh, kill steal, and destroy, but is rendered powerless by the greater spirit of God who lives within each believer. Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophets are no match for God. As believers yield themselves to the one who lives within them, they experience continual victory in the daily battles of the forces of evil. This is a great promise that provides great assurance, hope, and comfort. You see, our victory that we experience over the prince of this world, Jesus secured for us. On Calvary. You're probably familiar with the name Martin Luther, the Roman Catholic monk whose study led him to believe that the Church of Rome was corrupt. On October 13, 1517, he posted his 95 Theses to the door of the Church of Wittenberg, inviting debate. Luther broke from Rome in 1521, and it's ironic that this Catholic monk is generally regarded as the father of the Protestant Reformation. 
leader of the German Reformation. In addition to his skills as a writer and a translator and a preacher, Luther was a, an amateur musician who also wrote over 37 hymns. One, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, is referred to as the Battle Hymn of the Reformation. Now, if you haven't listened to the words recently, listen to them now. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not as equal. This is why you should never sing this hymn and just sing the first verse. Some people would even think on earth is not his equal, it's talking about Jesus. No, Luther is describing the evil one. And then in the next verse he says, Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And it's then this next verse that wonderfully captures what John is writing to believers. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. This is one of the reasons I still like to sing hymns in church, by the way. The nuclear submarine thresher had a heavy steel bulk, bulkheads and heavy steel armor so it could dive deep and withstand the pressure of the ocean. Unfortunately, on a test run back in 1963, the thresher's nuclear engine quit and it could not get back to the surface. So it sunk deeper and deeper into the ocean. The pressure became immense. The heavy steel bulkheads buckled. The thresher was crushed with 129 people inside. The Navy searched for the thresher with a research craft that was much stronger than submarines. It was shaped like a steel ball and was lowered into the ocean on a cable. They finally located the thresher at a depth of 8,400 feet, one and a half miles down. It was crushed like an eggshell. That's not the surprise, for the pressure at that depth is tremendous, 3,600 pounds per square inch. What was surprising to the searchers is that they saw fish at that depth. And these fish didn't have inches and inches of steel to protect them. They appeared to have normal skin, only a fraction of an inch thick. How could those fish survive under all that pressure? How come they're not crushed by the weight of water? Well, the answer is they have a secret. Their secret is they have the same pressure inside themselves as they have on the outside. And John assures us, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We will be victorious in the battle against Satan because Jesus poured his spirit into our hearts. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Skip down with me to verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. John says, you can know you're saved. You can know you are a member of the family of God because you have the Holy Spirit. So how can you tell if someone has the Holy Spirit living in them? How can you be certain that the Holy Spirit lives in you? By faith and by fruit. We accept by faith that when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, that God gives to us the Holy Spirit. Paul says, for by one spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free, we have been all made to drink of one spirit. The Bible says that we have been sealed 
with the Holy Spirit, signifying that we belong to God. And folks, both the baptism and the sealing of the Holy Spirit are works of God through His Spirit. They both relate to our position in Christ. And there's no place that I know in the Bible where we're commanded to seek them or work for them or wait for them. They have already been done. We are told, however, to pursue the filling of the Spirit which is learning how to live in submission to the Spirit's leading in our lives. That filling of the Spirit is also appropriated by faith. Let me ask you something. Do you pray daily? Lord, fill me with your Spirit. And then, by faith, accept that you're filled? I like the story of a, of a, of a guy at prayer meeting every every time he would pray the same thing lord please fill me with your spirit fill me with your spirit and a little old lady who had gotten tired of hearing him say that prayed lord don't do it he leaks <laughs> well i think the truth is we all leak don't we but the filling of the spirit that continual experiencing of putting our lives under the authority of the leadership of the spirit uh, then becomes walking in the spirit or living under the spirit's control and that's directly tied to obedience to god's word you can't do the one without the other i can't be disobedient to the truth of scripture and claim that i'm being led by the spirit but when we are filled with the spirit when we are living under the authority of god's word then there's a certain kind of character that we will demonstrate that the bible compares to fruit but the fruit of the spirit is love Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now let me just point out that while some of those qualities you might come by naturally, this is not human fruit. This is the fruit of the Spirit. It is a supernatural kind of fruit. A supernatural kind of character that the Spirit of God produces in and through you, perhaps most often seen in the context of trials and testing and suffering. It's when the Spirit gives you the ability to love the unlovely, to have joy and peace in the midst of difficulty and uncertainty, to demonstrate patience and kindness and goodness in the face of adversity and cruelty and mistreatment, to experience faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control when everything in you wants to fight back and retaliate or get even. This is the spirit fruit that's developed in the life of the obedient believer in Jesus. J.D. Greer is credited with saying, many of us think that the Holy Spirit is like our pituitary gland. You know it's there, you're glad you got it, you don't want to use it, but you're not exactly sure what it does. But John affirms that God has given us his spirit, which is a confirmation that we really are Christians, and because of the spirit's presence, we can know what is true. We can stand firm against that which is untrue. And we can day by day become more like Jesus. John says we're victors, overcomers, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Let's give thanks. Father, I do thank you for the presence of your spirit. And we pray truly, Lord, that as individual believers and as a church, that you would fill us and that we would experience a continual feeling that, Lord, we would learn what it means to walk with you. I thank you for giving us your presence in our lives. And I thank you that it is the Spirit of God that guides us into truth. And so we pray for his wisdom in our lives and we pray for his direction in our lives. And we pray, Father, that he would reproduce his character in our lives. We admit to you, Lord, that uh, we do leak. But we thank you for your love and your grace and your forgiveness. And this morning, I ask that you would help us uh, to apply this entire gathering to, to our lives today. And that, Lord, whatever you would want to say to us, that we would have ears to hear. Again, Father, thank you for every person. And I pray now, Lord, you would guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing a closing song. And uh, worship involves a, a decision on our part when we gather together.
we make the decision of what God is asking us to do today. And if your decision is one that you want to share publicly, then as we're singing, I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seat and join me here at the front. Tell me how we can minister to you. If you're watching online and there's a decision you want to make, please just let us know right now and we'll respond as soon as we can. The most important decision that you can make is to trust Jesus as your Savior. And if you've never made that decision and want to talk to someone about doing that right now, then please come. Let's stand together and sing, and you come as the Lord leads. for being in our lives through the presence of your Spirit. And we do ask that you would take your rightful place as the King who sits on our throne. And so, Lord, wherever, Lord, we need to yield, then make that clear to us. Uh, Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your great patience. Thank you for demonstrating your love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And thank you for your purpose and uh, that you have for us every single day. Father, we thank you for this day and, and, and are grateful for the opportunity to join together and to worship. And as we leave and, Lord, go back out into this week, we pray again for your direction and your leading and the filling of your spirit. We pray that you might create opportunities for us to share his love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. <laughs>